Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Progressive Israel Network uh, post-election webinar. Uh, I am Hadar Suskin, the president of Americans for Peace Now. I am really glad to have you all with us. Um, in just a moment, I will introduce my fabulous colleagues who are here. Uh, for those of you who are regulars on APN webinars, you know that this is the part where I filibuster a little bit because it takes a moment for uh, everybody to actually come in the Zoom room. So uh, again, thank you for joining us. We look forward to a great conversation. Whew, the numbers are filling up fast, which is really, really excellent. Um, of course, they're filling up because everyone has come together to uh, talk about some difficult things. And for those of you who, who know me and know us, if you're wondering if I called some of my friends and said, do you want to you know, sit around together and commiserate around the elections? The answer is yes. And we decided to turn it into a webinar. And luckily for you, my friends are brilliant experts. So um, we are getting there. Um, so again, I will kick us off. I am Hadar Suskind. I'm the president and CEO of Americans for Peace Now. I welcome you all to this Progressive Israel Network webinar. Uh, I am thrilled today to be joined by my colleagues, Libby Linkensky from New Israel Fund and Jeremy ben -Ami from J Street. Um, thank you also to all of the other PIN, uh, PIN colleagues and members who uh, are sharing this and are joining us. And we are, of course, oh, as always, honored and thrilled to be joined by really Israel's preeminent pollster, uh, Dahlia Shinling, who is going to walk us through what uh, has been, let's be honest, a really difficult week. Um, before I hand it over to Dahlia and, and bring everybody else in, I do want to note, um, first of all, just logistics actually for this webinar. Um, if you know there will be time for questions and we welcome them and we want your questions, please use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of the screen and we will be reading through those and get to as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, we're not gonna be calling on people for live questions. So don't use the hand raise, use the Q&A. Um, and again, before we turn to talking about this week, uh, I wanna note today is November 4th. And I think that uh, probably almost everyone on here does not need a reminder of what that is, but that is the English anniversary date of uh, Yitzhak Rabin's assassination. And I know for sure, and unless there are people younger than 27 on here, in which case, thank you and welcome. Um, every single one of us knows where we were. Every single one, one of us knows what we were doing on that on that really um, just horrible day. And you know, we we actually may talk about it a little bit because it is uh, there's a pretty direct line between that and and the events of of this week and the elections. But just wanted to take that moment and, and share with all of you, um, you know. That, that we are sitting together in this. And now I'm gonna stop rambling um, and I am going to turn it over to Dahlia and say, Dahlia, take it away. But you have to unmute. Uh-oh. Uh, or a, I don't know if you can unmute Dahlia because for some reason our Dahlia is muted. And... It's going to be a very short webinar if we can't hear from Dahlia. Uh, it's me. Sorry, it, it had nothing to do with you guys. It was all about my trying to get to back to my window. So thank you, everybody. Sorry for the slight delay there. Um, and thanks, everybody, for joining. I am not going to look at who's on the guest list because I'll probably want to say hi to a lot of you. It's been a, a difficult week. Uh, what I'm going to try to do is go through the basic results, which I know everybody knows, but I just to point out a few you know, trends, what ch I want to look at what changed from last time, what actually happened, and what it what I think it says about Israeli society. Uh, then I'll try to go through briefly why this happened, um, cut through some of the theories that are running around out there, and briefly then get into what it might mean for the next government and what that government might do. All of that in 10 to 15 minutes. Guys, if I if I go over, just you know, give me a signal because I'm gonna share screen so that we can we can see a few things. Um, that is why I was briefly delayed because I was looking for my share screen. Now let's see if I can find it again. One sec. Hmm. Almost there. All right. Don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Okay, let's try this again. It's open on my desktop, but not showing here, that's strange. 
Okay, maybe what I'll do is send it to one of you guys in the meantime, and then somebody else will be able to share it in a second, because for some reason I'm seeing it on my screen, but it's not showing up when I try to share screen. So, okay, Let's that will take that. just one second. We'll, we'll get it there. And Yeah, we'll get it. Um, Hadar, I'm sending this to you, okay? Okay, great. As everybody knows, you know, there's the election and then there's the long process of actually forming the government. So this is just part of the process. We got to, you know, take. I was thinking, you know, there's the dictatorship that we might be seeing in Israel. And then there's the dictatorship of uh, technology. That too. So anyway, um, when you get that Hadar, I just yep. sent it to you. So you'll be I'm sorry about the glitch, guys. But anyway, I want to just make sure we're all on the same page. We know that the current the the parties that are that are expected to go into a government with Netanyahu have won. We thought they were gonna have 65 seats from the first night. In the end, they have 64 seats out of 120. Those four parties are Torah Judaism, uh, Shas, religious Zionism, and Likud. So this is breaking through the cycle of what happened over the last four elections where they only, they couldn't get a majority. What I'll show you when we see, it, what, when we see, so that's the big change from last time. What I'm gonna show you when you see the slides is that Actually, in terms of the parties that and, and members of Knesset who identify or who, or, or who represent right-wing ideologies, I think we have to remind ourselves, and this is something I think is getting lost in some of the commentary, that the parties that are supporting Netanyahu are not the only ones who represent right-wing ideologies. Okay, so for, given that this is a progressive forum, we have to remember that Avigdor Lieberman is being seen as a sort of neutral actor in the Israeli system, but he's not, okay? Um, if anybody, reads platforms like I do, he still supports, for example, a two-state solution, but based on moving borders in a way that effectively strips people of their citizenship, something that he has been proposing for many years. So these are undemocratic positions. Uh, Gidon Saar's party, who is seen as sort of, you know, potential savior of the opposition to Netanyahu bloc in the previous election, <clears throat> comes out of a long tradition of being with the Likud. He was certainly on the right flank, if you ever hear him talking about uh, Palestinian territories, what he calls Judea and Samaria. You could mistake him for the far right wing flank of Likud even today. And therefore, again, apologies, we'll get the slides up in a minute. But uh, when you see, when I count it up, so this is my logic. I count Lieberman in the right wing parties ideologically. I count Gidon Saar's four uh, residual members of his New Hope party that went in together with Benny Gantz in their party called National Unity as right wing as well, because they came out of the right wing of Likud. When you add all of those together, we're looking at 74 seats out of 120. That differs from the last election uh, by two seats. So in the last election, if you do the same count of what the parties represent uh, ideologically, we had 72 seats going to those right-wing parties. So I will also tell you that from my counts in previous years, this is the highest ever. Of course, it depends a little bit on how you categorize parties, but the highest count I had by including even somewhat centrist parties, but leaning right, was in 2003, when 69 out of 120 seats went to right-wing parties. And for a long time, there was a sort of range of 60, 61, 65 to 67 seats. 61 was the low point in 2013 after Yeshatid was formed and drew voters from both sides. 67, if you include Moshe Kahlon, which I do, because again, he came out of the right flank of Likud, um, was in 2015. So why are we getting such a high portion now of 72 seats. You know, I, the question, this is what I wanna, I wanna look at and we'll talk about it in the next section. But before I do that, and I wanna um, just give you a little bit of about the numbers so we can see what actually did happen in these elections just for a few of the parties, not to go through too much data, but you know, Yesh gained 233,000 votes. So keep that in mind. But of course the balance and the problem was that, okay, so now we've got this up. So we can skip through, this is just the opening slide. You can, the next one you can see briefly. This is uh, the, the ideological breakdown that I just explained. So we, I don't think we need to stop on it, but you can see that there hasn't been that much of a change from last time, but the two additional seats going to right-wing parties. This is just what I explained before. And if you go to the next slide, that's where we are now with coalition building. Actually, that's just, again, well, yeah, that just reviews the coalition building. Okay. so. This is where we are, no, that's okay, right here, coalition building. Just so people remember exactly how many Netanyahu is working with now, the parties that are in his camp. Um, and Yesh Atid, again, gained a lot of seats, but they came at the expense of labor and merits. Labor and merits combined lost over 144,000 votes. 
Um, and to give you a, another sense of, I think, an interesting dynamic, Likud actually didn't do that well in these elections. You can see they only went up by two seats compared to last time. Likud gained just under 50,000 new votes, but religious Zionism, by contrast, won an additional 290,000 votes. Okay, so this is why we see the dynamics that we see. And it is sort of interesting to keep in mind that Likud actually didn't better its position that much. But why are we in this situation? You know, I think that one of the main arguments that we've heard, at least over the last few days, all the, as we say in Hebrew, all the knives are drawn and people are blaming each other on the center left. The, I'll, I'll run through briefly the theories. The first theory is that labor and merits should have moved, merged. And this is something that everybody's talking about. Merav Michaeli made a huge mistake. People said it at the time. Haaretz, uh, the newspaper Haaretz had tons of editorials about it. And many people are saying that again now. If they had merged, they would have crossed the threshold for sure. So the, so the theory goes. And we wouldn't be in a situation where there's no merits in the government. The second theory is that Yesha Tid made a huge mistake in the final stage of its campaign by campaigning for the votes that would have been going to labor and merits. And in fact, Mirav Michaeli over the last couple of days uh, blamed Yesha Tid for working too hard towards the end of the campaign to take votes away from the center left parties or the left wing parties, uh, which pushed them under the threat, pushed Maris under the threshold and to quote her almost pushed uh, labor under the threshold as well. My theory, and this is my favorite because it's my theory, is that the party that was supposed to be representing the, let's say, centrist uh, or even centrist leaning right flank of the opposition camp to Netanyahu, which was national unity, Benny Gantz and Gidon Sar. And we know that they did pull some small segment of right wingers away. But my theory is that they should have worked harder to grasp one of the biggest issues, one of the only issues that divides the right wing in order to pull off the moderate right. And that is protection of Israel's democratic institutions, particularly the judiciary. I've written a lot about this, and uh, if anybody's not sure what I'm talking about, well, I'm happy to talk about it more. But there is a big debate in Israel right now. Many people on the far right believe that the judiciary should be constrained. Uh, they don't believe in, they're losing a sense of legitimacy. And many people on the more moderate right, or what you might call traditional Likudniks, don't agree and think that this is the pillar of democracy. And I think that if Saar, especially as justice minister, should have campaigned hard on protecting the institutions of democracy in Israel in order to reassure right-wing voters that there is a place for them. I don't think they did that. They were basically didn't even discuss the issue. But all of those theories, okay, um, I think that they ignore a, a deeper structural factor. And here's where you can go to the next slide. And thanks again for pulling this uh, presentation up. The next slide shows the ideological breakdown. Now, many of you have, whoever has seen me talk before has probably seen some version of this slide or heard me discuss it, but the majority of Israelis are right wing, okay? And what you're seeing in the graph is the total weighted population of Jews and Arabs, according to the Peace Index survey conducted by Tel Aviv University in July of 2022. Um, I have, I, um, later data, but it's not, it's not for public use. And what we're seeing on the left in the red text is the breakdown between Jews and Arabs, okay, of people who self-identify. I repeat, these are self-identifications. This is not me categorizing them by any other, you know, any of my own random categorizations. And you can see that, first of all, among the Arab community, the idea of left, right, and center is not a great question. A lot of people don't want to answer the question. Uh, but if anything, there's a sort of even breakdown between center and left, but very few who consider themselves right wing. When you look at the Jewish respondents, we see a very high portion, 64%, who consider themselves right wing. That includes moderate right and firm right, and they're broken down mostly evenly. If anything, the firm right has a, an advantage over the moderate right, but it's almost an even breakdown. About a quarter centrist, and uh, this is at the lower end of the range, but about 11% who consider themselves left wing. That includes moderate and firm left combined. And in this case, the moderate category is generally bigger. Those who consider themselves firm left are mostly voting for merits, and they represent only a small portion of those, usually in the single digits. Uh, the upper range for the Jewish population in recent years is maybe 13, maximum 14%. So just to give you a sense of where we are. And if you go to the next slide, okay, you can see the long-term trend. Uh, if we can, there we go. This is among the Jewish population only, just because we don't have the same kind of historic data uh, for the Palestinian Israeli citizens of Israel. 
But what you can see is that the portion of Israelis who self-identify as left hasn't been a majority at, at any point here, but it went up and down and then down and then down. The center seems to range between 20 and 30%, but is generally even in recent years at about a quarter. But the right wing keeps climbing up. Where do they come from? They come from the declining portion of people who are moved from the left to the center, from the center to the right, or the whatever the don't know ranges. But it's been rising pretty steadily throughout that time. What I found notable was that up until January 2019, for a long time, it had not reached over 60%. For quite a long time, it was, you know, you know, I'm not giving you every single survey here, but for I would say the five years before that, it was over 50%, but in the mid 50% range. And then it reached up to 60%. And then as you can see from January 2019 onward, the moment we have three surveys, it's a trend. This number isn't going back down anytime soon and it seems to be a, a continuing trend. And so that's the structure of the Israeli voting population. Now remember, Arab turnout, turnout of Palestinian citizens of Israel was better than the worst predictions, okay? The worst, the range of polls that we saw for predicted turnout among the Arab community was between 32% at the lowest uh, level that I saw uh, in a survey just from a few weeks before the elections. And the upper range, you know, that number seemed to go up closer to the elections, reaching over 45%. But in the end, the early analysis that we're seeing suggests about 53% of voters, uh, of, of the Arab Palestinian voters went out to vote. Um, and Keep in mind, we often talk about 20% of the Israeli population that is Arab, but on the other hand, there's a heavy young portion of that population. Among the voting age population, it's more like 17%. If you take 53% of the 17% who are Palestinian citizens of Israel, we're looking at about 9% of the total voters, roughly 91% of the people who actually went out and voted who are Jewish. And therefore, their breakdown is going to look a lot more like the ideological breakdown you see on this slide. That is why we have 72, 74 parties, essentially. So 64% translates roughly. I mean, this is not, these are not precise, but roughly into something like 70 seats. Um, and there are also centrists who decided to vote for the parties that I'm considering right wing, right? People who are self-identified as centrists, but voted for Lieberman or, or uh, even Gidon Saar and Benny Gantz's party. We can't, you know, completely pull them apart. And so I think it's just worth remembering that, and I don't want to be defensive because I do work on campaigns myself. I don't want to pretend the campaigns don't make mistakes. But when you're starting with this structure of the population, there's a very limited range of activity, a very limited range in which people will actually be able to move. Okay, now I don't wanna go on for too long. I wanna talk briefly about what this will mean for coalition building and for the kinds of policies we'll talk about. And for that, uh, feel free to move to the next slide. Great, okay. So I don't see too many options, to be honest, for building the next government. Basically, we were all feverishly considering various scenarios if the, if the results had been stuck. But what we're looking at now is what we say in Hebrew is Yamin al male which means full right. United Torah Judaism, Shas, Religious Zionism, and Likud, they have enough, they could form that coalition tomorrow. In fact, they're actually indicating that they will form a government within two weeks. They could, there's another possibility that, uh, that Netanyahu would try to bring in somebody from the other side, which I'm sure each side was planning on trying to do that when they thought that it might be a completely split election. That would mean he starts with his four parties, but tries to bring in a defector. To be honest, I can't think of very many defectors. Even though Gantz has sworn up and down that he will not do it, everybody else is a complete wall of resistance, including Gidon Saar. As far as we know, we're not inside their heads. Maybe Ra'am, but Ram has indicated they would go with anybody, but there's no way the parties within the full right coalition would go with Ram. And the only other option, which may be now, or as my colleague Anshul Pfeffer wrote in a, an article, uh, I think two days ago, um, this could happen at a later point as well. It could be that Netanyahu would form the full right government, but religious Zionism has already indicated that it intends to split up into its, its, its well, two of the three factions, with Bezalel Smotrich, who heads the National Unity Faction, splitting, and Itamar ben Gvir, who heads the Jewish Power, uh, Otsma Yehudi Faction, they could split. And that gives Netanyahu a little room for maneuver. He could find a way to leave them out of the coalition that is presumably 
uh, Itamar Ben Gvir's faction, or he could find a way to have some sort of a crisis later on uh, in a way that makes them leave and maybe try to balance them out or replacement, I call it the replacement theory, uh, with one of the defector, with a defector from the other side, whoever that is. But to be honest, there's not that much difference I would expect between any of these governments. In other words, they're, they're all basically heavily weighted towards very heavily right-wing policies. So what are they gonna do? We don't know exactly, but already we're hearing reports of what they are communicating they will do. Certainly three of the four parties in this full right government are very religious parties. You know, the ultra-Orthodox parties we know, but religious Zionism is made up of mostly, I, you know, as far as I can tell, largely religious voters, probably mostly religious voters, and probably uh, the more strict religious voters. Now, that they could also have a contingent of secular and traditionalist supporters, but until we get more sensitive data, we don't have reason, I don't have reason to think that it's a big contingent. And they have said very openly in their platforms, which to their credit are very detailed. I urge people to read them if you, if you read Hebrew. Um, they plan to uh, strengthen as much as they can uh, the Jewish, uh, you know, domin the dominance of Jewish religion over public life and private life. They want to roll back some of the reforms and attempted reforms of the outgoing government, including reforms to what Israelis now understand to be an industry related to kashrut. They want to block anything like transportation for Shabbat. We heard rumors of the ultra-Orthodox parties campaigning, save the Shabbat, save the Shabbat. Uh, they might want to roll back um, reforms that were made under the pre outgoing health minister, Nitzan Horowitz, to provide budgeting for support for LGBT, you know, counseling and uh, various other community needs. Now, that is in terms of religion and state. And I think those are going to be some of their immediate demands. At least this is also being openly reported. To my mind, again, because I have been very focused, and I think many Israelis are, and people don't appreciate how much, on the issue of the right-wing attack on the judiciary, okay? Um, yeah, there's a slide. Religious Zionism put out a very detailed and very extreme plan for how they would undercut the authority of judicial institutions in Israel. But I think that the most, the biggest consensus within these right-wing parties is that the first thing they want to do, and a Likud member said this just yesterday, as his condition for going into the government, is to pass a law allowing the Knesset to override a Supreme Court ruling, striking down legislation for being unconstitutional. Okay, uh, I know this is confusing, we don't have a constitution, but the Supreme Court is really the only arbiter when uh, legislation is deemed to have violated the human rights spelled out in Israel's basic laws. The Knesset wants the right, well, the government wants the right to completely overturn that with the most minimal majority. Very detailed, I can get into it more. They openly say that they would like to pass to re-legislate the law that was frozen and then struck down that would make the settlements kosher, especially the settlements on private lands. This was a law that passed in 2017 that was struck down. They're not making a secret about their attempt to advance annexationist policies. They're talking about religious Zionism has talked about trying to cancel the disengagement law, not because I think they really want to rebuild settlements in Gaza, but because they are uh, very anxious to rebuild settlements in the Northern West Bank, the four outposts that were, uh, that were dismantled in 2005. We don't know what the impact of this kind of government would be on trying to protect Netanyahu from his, from his legal uh, prosecution, which is ongoing. His trials are ongoing. And I think we have to anticipate an ongoing attempt to politicize the judiciary, especially the Judicial Appointment Committee, but also to extend political control over the public service in general. I mean, there's a whole narrative that there's a deep state. It's the, it's the civil service that has these nameless shadowy bureaucrats who have taken over the country and are you know, destroying the will of the people. And the plan that religious Zionism has put out is very much uh, um, structured around increasing political control over all of those aspects. So you know, I'm gonna stop here because a lot of it is speculation, but just keep in mind where we are, how we got here and what this kind of government is likely to do. Um, should I answer the question now about how people define themselves as left or right? Because we're getting questions about that. Yeah. So first Let's of all, remind Yeah, please. Yes. Okay. So first of all, remember when I say left or right in these breakdowns, I'm talking about how people self-identify in surveys. But I can tell you that when we look deeper into their attitudes, when we cross tabulate people who are left-wing, centrist or right-wing and look at how they think, the number one dividing factor is where they are on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, even if it's not openly on the agenda. Attitudes towards the conflict 
the two-state solution settlements at one time when we used to test compromises and concessions, all of those are the deepest polarized divisions. They basically define what it means to be left, right, and center in Israel, despite the fact that it's not openly on the agenda of any of the parties. That's why I consider it a specter hovering over everything, even if you can't see it. Underneath that is religion and state, the second most divisive issue. The reason it's not the only divide, the top divisive issue is because there are many secular right-wingers who prefer separation of religion and state, but they are very hawkish and right-wing and militarist on the conflict. And the third and increasingly prominent aspect is precisely what I mentioned before, attitudes towards democratic institutions, even democracy itself, and particularly uh, the way this manifests in recent years is the attack on the judiciary or the support for judicial independence. There are other issues, a little bit of the conservative liberal kinds of issues we might see in the states, but the one issue that never divides Israelis uh, in terms of left, right, and center is economic themes. I know this is strange for, um, for Americans. There are minor divisions at the fringes. Some people will say they like Lieberman's free market economic policies, but believe me, if they're left wing, they're not voting for Lieberman, even if they like his economic policies. Um, and in general, the priority levels are no different in between left, right, and center when it comes to economic themes. They all think that everything costs, you know, everything costs too much and the state should be helping, but they differ vastly in the, both the priority level and what they think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and everything related to it. And I should include within that Jewish Arab identity issues in Israel. It's not just, it's the broad, you know, um, <clears throat> subject of Israel, Israel's identity and Jewish identity. Uh, so those are the three, I, I see those as the three most um, prominent axes defining left, right, and center in Israel. And I'll stop here. Excellent. Dahlia, thank you so much. That is obviously a tremendous amount to take in. And, you know, it's easy to look at just, okay, they got 64 seats. That's the ratio. But obviously looking at everything underneath it uh, is really important to help us understand both what happened and what, you know, what can happen in the future. Um, I want to turn now to Jeremy and uh, really, I think, open the question, Jeremy, about, you know, because we, we put out this webinar and we said we wanted Dahlia to come share this information with us, but also that we collectively wanted to have the conversation about what does it mean in this country also? What does it mean for American Jewish organizations, the American Jewish community, our own government? Um, so Jeremy, why don't you take it away? Thanks, Adar, and uh, thanks, Dahlia, for the presentation. And I'll slip in a question uh, to Dahlia that was on my mind. I'm sure other people may have thought it too, and then I'll answer your question, and maybe we can circle back to it, which is, um, you know, we have this phenomenon where 6% of the Israeli vote was lost thanks to what happened with Meretz and uh, Balad. And so the increase in seats from 72 to 74, to me, seems more of a mathematical uh, result of the fact that we lost six percent of the vote, and if if there weren't a threshold, what what would be the uh, breakdown of the percentage of the vote for right wing versus last time? And did in fact that percentage go down? Because if they only gained two seats and the you know left lost six percent of its vote to be wasted, it seems to me actually that the results may not have been any more right wing than last time. It's just that the you know parliamentary result ends up being there. So hang on to that question and that thought. I'd love to hear the answer. Um, but I will answer uh, Hadar's question and not avoid that. Uh, obviously, what we are is we are all Americans, right? We, and we are, the question for us is what can we as American citizens do? Uh, what is the American government's policy? What are we saying into the political realm? What are our uh, Jewish communal institutions and leaders saying? And that's where all of us in the Progressive Israel Network come together. It's certainly the focus of J Street's work. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll hit on three things. One is, uh, what should the United States and its government and officials do related to individual people like Itamar Ben-Gvir if they are appointed to ministries and other positions of importance? Uh, and it would be our thought at J Street, and I think probably it's, uh, you know, getting a lot of play in, in other places as well. I think uh, British Jews are saying this uh, already uh, through their institutions, uh, that there are certain people who are over the line, who are over a red line. Uh, Itamar Ben-Gvir is a uh, criminal, uh, convicted terrorist, uh, and his incitement to violence and his uh, racism should have and has in the past prevented other people from even being allowed to run for the Knesset. Uh, and the United States should have a red line on Itamar Ben-Gvir uh, and any other 
people who might be considered for positions in a new coalition or government uh, who have a record of being convicted uh, for incitement to terror and to violence. And so I think, A, uh, on a, a per, the personality level, there should be some red lines from the US government, and we'll be advocating that the Biden administration make that clear. Second is, is policy. Um, this new government is obviously going to uh, pursue perhaps, uh, you know, again, annexation. Uh, there are other aspects of their policy that are going to uh, be uh, retrograde back to where we were. Um, the United States needs to make clear what its policies are. Uh, this, this administration has never actually revoked the Trump peace plan. Uh, it has not reaffirmed its commitment to a two-state solution affirmatively. It hasn't said that the territories are occupied. It hasn't said that settlements are illegal. These are policies that this government, now with a government led by the far right, needs to make clear. The United States government needs to make clear. We need a set of policies from the Biden administration and from Congress that are very clear about where the U.S. falls vis-a-vis -vis what this government is going to do. And then finally, I'd say tone. Uh, the Biden administration has been accommodating of the P. Bennett government, uh, and it has kept its differences quiet. That should not be the case uh, when there is a government led by the people that we are now seeing. It. The, the tone of the United States needs to shift, and the public statements need to be clearer. So those are three areas that I would put out there. Libby, I'll leave it to you to talk a bit about the Jewish community and the Jewish communal organizations. Thanks, Jeremy. You know, I think all of those points that you hit, you know, we're, we're all uh, we're all sitting with, we're all trying to figure out what those next steps, but I'll just say, you know, for APN, we certainly are uh, completely in agreement. This is different and we need to respond differently and the US government and our elected officials need to respond differently. And, you know, that issue that we've all heard so many times of, you know, behind closed doors and quiet conversations, um, I think on the governmental level that needs to change. And now I want to go to Libby actually and talk about, you know, what do you think about that frame, both when it comes to Israeli civil society, because obviously NIF is so deeply enmeshed in that, um, but also our American Jewish community. Thank you so much. Um, and a big thank you to you, Hadar, and to Ori for organizing this webinar, both because Hearing from Dahlia and from Jeremy and from you, Hadar, is always enlightening and clarifying to me. But it's also after this hard week, it is, it feels good to be together. It feels good to be with you, and it feels good to be in such a big group of supporters of our organizations and other Progressive Israel Network organizations. It's gonna feel doubly good to be in Washington in just a few weeks for the J Street Conference after years of not being together. It always feels like we we have each other's backs and there are many more like-minded people than it feels like when you're just sitting in front of your Twitter. Um, not that I do that so often, um, but it's been a hard week. It's very, it's really sobering. And I wanna be clear um, that this is not about um, not accepting the results of the election or denying the truth of those results or saying that something happened incorrectly in the elections. But as Dahlia said earlier, it, it is our job to stand against what some of these results show us and to fight back against those trends. And like Jeremy just said, in terms of the American government, I think as the American Jewish community, we need to also be much clearer now about what our red lines are when it comes to Israeli leadership. And this is not about denying that Kahanists were legitimately elected in a democratic election, but that does not mean that they need to be welcomed in our Jewish communal spaces. And it is long time for us to have some red lines when it comes to the big tent of the American Jewish community on the right. Kahanism is over that line. Just because Kahanists were elected does not mean that they need to be embraced and Jewish organizations that are embracing them need to be over our red line of the Big Ten, period. Um, so that is on that level. I wanna, I wanna say a couple of things about the role of Israeli civil society um, in this moment. Um, I wanna first just remind that 
the job of civil society is not necessarily to be to represent the majority. It's not necessarily always popular. Every achievement that we've had, whether it's through strategic litigation, through organizing in the streets, through organizing in the Knesset on policy change has been hard won. Nothing has been given to civil society organizations or to marginalized communities in Israel for free. Everything has been a creative, strategic struggle and fight. And we have had many, many accomplishments over the last 50 years since the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, ACRI, my alma mater was founded as probably the first Israeli civil society organization and the largest human rights organization. Every one of those things, Alice Miller, recognition of Arab villages, new resources to Arab schools in Israel, all of those kinds of things, LGBT rights that have been granted through legislation and through high court rulings, all of those involved a struggle that was deeply unpopular at the time. That is not going to stop because of this government. That is going to double down within the framework of this government. And as certain tools become harder, we develop new tools to fight those fights and to stand on the side of all Israelis and all people living under Israel's control. Again, that is not going to stop. That's going to double down. And so again, it's so great to have so many supporters with us today. We need all of that support, all of our organizations do, to double down in what's going to be a uphill and harder fight. Over this last year during the change government, civil society was in a crash course about what to do when we're not so much in opposition, where we do have doors open in some ministries, where we are called on to have actual policy recommendations. That was a crash course. We learned a lot over this last year, but what we know how to do is fight. That's, that is what civil society is built for. And so, yes, I absolutely agree. And I do not mean to say that it's all the same and things are going to be easy. They have just gotten much, much harder. And that is why our work is gonna be doubly important and doubly difficult to do. But that doesn't mean that anyone's giving up, we are not. And so that's one thing I wanted to, to, to share. Another piece um, is that, you know, New Israel Fund is a 501c3. And that's not just a legal term. It means that we're not an electoral campaigning organization and most civil society organizations aren't. They're, our strategies and our view is longer term. These elections are a snapshot, a very, very disconcerting, horrible snapshot, as Dahlia said, like what we see underneath. Um, and also not a shock and not that dramatically different in terms of like what's under the hood as what we've seen in recent years in Israel. And it's it's time for a good hard look at what the long-term vision and the long-term strategies need to be now. Um, one of the things that we've learned from the far right and from the right is that they've invested in narrative strategies in changing people's hearts and minds for many decades. The terminology is settling the hearts and mind. That was a, a concerted strategy of the settler movement to normalize the settlement enterprise in the hearts and minds of average Israelis through tourism, through arts and culture, through media. And while we have been busy standing on the side of all Israelis in the courts, in legislative processes, it, it's now very clearly time to also be looking at how we invest in narrative, changes, narrative change among Israelis, understanding that actually left-wing policies are what will make people's lives actually better and more livable there, whether it's on climate, on LGBT, on the conflict. Um, and so there is, while, while we don't need the majority in order to make those policy changes, we just need a critical mass and a good strategy, we do need to also be investing in reaching people on that hearts and minds level because we're not going to get anywhere um, with this trend continuing the way it is. Um, the last thing I wanna say um, is about Itamar Ben-Gvir. Um, as Jeremy started, and as Hadar mentioned earlier, this is the 27th anniversary of the assassination of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. 
just several weeks before that assassination, the prime minister's car was encircled by a group of young colonists. Um, and one of them ripped the insignia off of his car and held it up to a media camera. That was a young Itamar Benvir. And what he said to the camera was, we got the car and we're gonna get him next. And just a couple of weeks later, Isaac Rabin was assassinated by another young far right winger, uh, Igal Amir. So the danger that Kahanism and that Itamar Ben-Gvir represents is very real. We should not have a short term memory about that. And all attempts to normalize it need to be pushed back against. We'll be here to do that. Um, yeah. And um, I, I want to. I want you to have enough time to ask some questions to Dahlia. So I think I'll stop there. And again, thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in a few weeks in Washington. Right. Thank you, Libby, um, and thank you, Jeremy. Uh, for everyone who is following along here, uh, we just posted a link to register for the J Street Conference in the chat. So if you haven't taken a look at that yet, feel free to do so. Uh, and when you get there, make sure to go up to Libby. Drinks on her. She invited everyone. Um, <laughs> but I do hope to see you there. Look, there's a lot in this. There's a lot in this week's election and you just went back obviously 27 years to Ben Gvir. Uh, Dahlia, I wanna hand it over to you to sort of, I think respond. Jeremy, I think particularly addressed a couple of things, but also you wanna to respond to what Libby said and then we will take more of these questions. Okay, I'm not on mute. Uh, yeah, in terms of what Jeremy said, I mean, you know, yes, there's a mathematical game going on here, but remember there were, there, there was at least one firmly right-wing party that went under the threshold as well, Ayala Chaked's Jewish Home Party. Uh, it didn't get, it didn't do nearly as well as Meretz. It didn't come nearly as close. It got about 56,000 seats. Uh, there were two parties that represent purely economic themes, but as far as we know, they would probably have been willing to go into either block of the Netanyahu or the non-Netanyahu parties. We have to take those into account. Another 30,000 seats. I mean, so I would have to really count up the percentages of parties in this election and last election that can be clearly categorized as right or left. I think it's not quite that simple. I mean, you're right in general, right? The number, the percentage of people who identify as left, right, or center doesn't change overnight. You saw the graph, it's a long, slow, incremental process. And the last election was only a year ago. So I don't wanna make it sound like there was a dramatic difference between this and last. In fact, if I had had, if I hadn't had the technical glitch and we'd spent a little more time with those slides, you would see that there was frankly, incredibly, uh, incredible stability between the two elections. And yeah, two mandates is, you know, not a huge percentage of the voters. Uh, but we are, my, my bigger point is that we're looking at a very large portion of Israeli society that simply is right wing and a very small portion that is left wing. And so, you know, we have to understand that this is who the population is. It's not you know, that one campaign made a better, you know, did better or worse or made one mistake that changed everything. I will say one more thing about what it means to be left, right, and center. I think that it's worth pointing out that in, uh, I think I can safely say that in recent years, the, the political level of what it means to be right, the kinds of things that the political right wing stands for, which has an enormous influence over voters, has become more extreme. Okay, so if in the past, let's say in the 90s, uh, to be right wing meant to compromise less and give less, you know, give like even Menachem Begin offered autonomy but not statehood to the Palestinians, and that was considered a right wing approach, even though many on the right didn't like it. Um, but negotiating over the kinds of compromises that Israel was willing to give for how many kilometers, you know, or meters Israel was prepared to possibly withdraw from the Golan Heights, remember that, you know. Uh, those were all things that were on the table, and that was the range between right and left-wing attitudes. What it means to be right-wing in Israel now is nobody nobody has talked about different kinds of concessions in years. Nobody has talked about which settlements are candidates for evacuation in years. I mean, I can't remember the last time there was anything about that in the newspapers or that I was asked to poll on it. What the right-wing is talking about is how much to annex, how soon, and how openly. And that has yep. been the discussion for several years already. And the attack, what I consider to be an all out multi systems assault on the judiciary and specifically on them on redefining democratic values. This does touch on something that Libby said, um, changing hearts and minds, creating a message. I, of course, I think that the right wing has done this very effectively. I see how I'm just using the example that is, I think, again, one of the less understood and, and, and really fundamental issues, which is the attack on democratic institutions. You can see it in the right wing media, you can see it coming from the top political levels, you can see it coming from very well funded right wing think tanks with who, who you know all have anonymous donors <laughs> coming from the US. Um, and 
these are for that reason, it's a very multi-layered approach. So people are getting it from all sides. And it's not surprising that more and more people, especially if they're in right-wing, you know, media and communication circles, distrust the Supreme Court, for example. This is what we know from tracking polls at the Israel Democracy Institute. So that kind of, you know, clear, tight, repeated, uh, multi-directional message can work, but I have to inject a note of realism. The reason why the Israeli right has been particularly effective at that is not because they're, you know, they're, they're all geniuses and they all have amazing campaigners and they all have lots of money. It's because they've been in control. So you have a bigger mouthpiece. You have the mouthpiece of the prime minister who's been in power for 12 years and is the country's best communicator. True, he has his own special funded free newspaper um, and lots of money going to those think tanks, but all of that is much more easily amplified when you are in control. So I think that these are sort of inseparable. We have to do everything we can, but we also have to realize that we need to find you know, compensation strategies for the fact that the left wing is not about to be in control anytime soon. That doesn't mean never because you know, people shift over time, trends change, pendulums swing. Thanks, Dahlia. I want to make sure we get to questions because we have a lot of them. So I'm going to I'm going to roll a couple together, Dahlia. I'm going to ask them to you. And then Jeremy and Libby, if you want to weigh in on them also, please feel free. So first of all, I know you touched on this a little bit, um, but, you know, everyone has talked about this is the fifth election in four years, et cetera. There's a lot of feeling that this is now different, right? That this government is going to be, you know, could be a four-year government. Um, so start, maybe address that. And what does that mean? Is that true? And then I want to um, swing us, if not in the uh, brightly positive, at least more in that direction. So I want to put together two questions. Uh, you know, there was a question about, you know, outright full-on annexation, as was discussed, I guess, two summers ago. Um, you know, at this point, the Abraham Accords are out there, which Netanyahu considers a huge victory, a major accomplishment. They're obviously both in Israel and, frankly, in the United States, you know, very popular. Is you know, do you think that the Abraham Accords can serve perhaps to keep um, you know, du jour annexation off the table. And then the second question that I actually think goes with that is we've talked about and we've all read a lot about, you know, the worst we can fear from the new government, but what is the best we could actually realistically hope for? And I like the, the framing of this. The question is, what should I be hoping for as I go to sleep tonight? So Dahlia, if you can start with those two and then Jeremy and Libby, if you want to weigh in, please. Okay, I have three questions. I mean, that's what I, I wrote down three. Uh, four-year government, I, I don't think, and most Israeli governments don't last four years. So even though we do seem to have four parties that are currently, you know, that, that appear to be seamlessly aligned ideologically, simply by virtue of Israel's political culture, I doubt that they would last four years. It's not impossible. There are some governments that have lasted four years. Uh, Netanyahu's had, has done better at that. than. Or we should say not, not six months, you know. It like... seems like it would probably not last six months, although... Um, will it last more than six months in its original form is a completely different question. Okay? So it could, Netanyahu does know how to play politics, it could change form. So, uh, but I do think we're not gonna, I don't see us going into a new election cycle in six months, put it that way. It, it seems like we have more stability now. In terms of uh, whether the Abraham Accords can help keep annexation off the table, I would very much caution people not to get stuck on, on declared declarations of annexation. I think we should all internalize that Israel is annexing all the time on the ground. Israel is doing that through expanding natural growth of settlements, expanding the infrastructure, closed military zones, declaring land to be state land and, and agricultural land, and you know, uh, putting pressure on Palestinians to basically their lives are becoming just impossible in area C and pressuring them to leave for areas A and B without physically pressuring them, but making their phys physical conditions very difficult. I think we have to recognize all of those are actually more effective and more irreversible to my mind than a declaration. Okay, so I, I would caution you not to wait for <laughs> declared annexation. In a way, the Abraham Accords gives Netanyahu cover to keep doing that. Okay, and the previous government did it too. I mean, the change government, as much as I think it was a better government in many ways for Israel's, what I think Israel's needs are, it, it, it did not stop those processes. In many ways, it speeded them up, sped them up. Uh, and in terms of uh, what's the best thing we can expect from this government, honestly, I think it's too soon to tell. I can say one thing, which is that um, <laughs> this is very really cold comfort. But last night we were, you know, getting little bits and pieces about what will come up in the negotiations for the coalition formation. And you know, the report now is that Likud is conveying, which certainly comes from Netanyahu, that uh, he will not be negotiating over the justice ministry. It will stay in the hands of Likud. It's off the table. 
does that really make me feel better that it won't go to somebody from religious Zionism who prepared this very extreme plan for what to do, knowing that many in Likud are completely committed to the, pretty much the same things as religious Zionism, maybe in slightly different form. I don't know, but I do think it was a signal to religious Zionism that there's areas you can't touch and we will you know, um, keep this within our range of what we want to seem acceptable. So I, it's complicated. I'm not exactly happy about it, but it does make me think that Netanyahu within himself, if I can look deep inside his soul for a second, both desperately wants to get out of his legal you know, prosecution um, and avoid jail and avoid a conviction. Um, and on the other hand, I think that he really does come from a tradition of supporting Demo you know, the, the, the legal institutions. And from everything we know, he was the one who was holding back some of the attempts to carry out these kinds of reforms also under Ayala Shaked when she was justice minister, all, when she was considered the most far right, who really brought the issue of uh, attacking the judiciary and weakening its authority to the fore in Israel as a political figure for four years between 2015 and 2019. And from everything we know, he sort of held back and he kind of put the brakes on passing an override law. And so I think he maybe wants to make sure that he controls whoever is at the justice ministry so that he can have more influence to make sure that it doesn't go too far and give you know, uh, critics the excuse to say, really, this is, has gone too far. This is no longer you know, a liberal democratic system. Um, I would personally say Israel is not a liberal democracy anyway because of other policies, but at least it does have democratic institutions. Okay, and this is one of them. And um, I think, I don't know if that really is hopeful. It's more like, is there any hope that it won't be as bad as the worst case scenario? And that's, I'm looking, I'm desperately looking for signs of that. Uh, what good might they do? I mean, I it's guess having a stable relevant. government. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I think some stability is still important because at least, you know, ministries will be funded and budget and a budget can be passed. And there are many areas of so, you know, society and social welfare and everything else, you know, all the uh, from public education to everything else we have that, in, that running a state involves, <clears throat> that needs continuity, that needs a proper budget. Um, and in fact, strangely, there are certain areas of Israeli life that don't have fundamentally deep divisions. For example, I think in general on, on environment policy, the Israeli parties aren't very significantly divided only in as much as it affects their communities. So we're seeing that they apparently the ultra-Orthodox parties would like to cancel the tax the previous government uh, passed in its budget for disposable you know, plates and uh, taxes on sugary drinks because that affects the ultra-Orthodox too much. Sure. But because otherwise, Shabbat. right, because having lots of kids means lots of dishes. And so, you know, I'd like to think there are certain things that Israeli society can get done simply because they don't tap into the deepest, most controversial issues. Thanks. So I want to open that, you know, that discussion also to, to Libby and then to Jeremy to see if there are things you want to add, either specifically on, you know, on that, from that perspective of Israeli civil society, American Jewish orgs or American political, but also whatever else you want to add. Libby. Sure. Um... Thanks. I, you know, I think the piece that I can add is um, it's not what I'm hopeful this government will do, though I do appreciate the cold comforts that Dahlia offered and I'll take them with me to bed tonight also. So thank you for that. Um, it's, I do think that, um, uh, I think there are some areas that need a dramatic revamp on the progressive side. And I think that when we are in opposition, that's the time to do that kind of work. Um, and I don't think that, you know, there was a question about, you know, shouldn't groups like NIF and J Street and APN like completely rethink everything that we're doing and, and how we're doing it. I don't think it's a complete rethink, but I think there are some areas in the Israeli politic and in Israeli civil society that will use this time of a, a longer term opposition um, to rebuild and rethink. And I think some of those areas um, have already gained some momentum in recent years, things that have to do with Arab Jewish partnership on every level of society in Israel, whether it's education, medicine, politics, arts and culture. Um, those are ideas that are um, gaining steam among the center left and the left. And we don't necessarily have the right infrastructure for that to be realized politically. And I have a hope that that will get underway now um, 
as a result of these results. And that is in part a civil society effort and it's in part a political effort. Again, I, we're a 501c3. So I'm not about to start up a new political party in Israel that's a joint Arab Jewish party that could be quite popular. But I have hope that something, that thoughts like that, ideas like that would come into fruition during this time of opposition. Um, and I also think an area of, I, I think there's a couple of areas related to combating extremism, fascism and Kahanism that now are in a much sharper um, relief and that's across the ocean as well. So, you know, that's A, part of a global trend and B, something that I think American Jewish institutions and the American government can play a very effective role in as fascists and Kahanists march forward creating and undoing Israeli policy um, to really develop more up-to-date and bold strategies to combat that extremism. And so I'm talking about both in the, in the political, but I'm also talking about things like the spread of extremism online um, and things that are happening on social media platforms that tech companies are allowing that they should not be allowing that are very, very dangerous. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think these are gonna be the months and years where there's a lot of new thinking about those two areas and some other areas um, coming out of civil society and coming out of the Israeli opposition movement, um, however we wanna define that. Um, that's my hope. Um, and that's also in part our commitment. So in the question of are, are there, do we need to rethink things? Yeah, for sure. And that doesn't mean stopping the things that we've all already been doing because they are absolutely essential. This is not the time to abandon court strategies, organizing strategies, this, we, we're not going to rethink those out. Those are absolutely necessary now in order for Israelis to be at least minimally protected from some dangerous policies that could be underway. I think it's definitely a yes and moment. So thank yeah. you for that, Libby. Um, Jeremy, and just before I hand it to you, I just want to say uh, we've got a lot still going. So we're going to do something we don't usually do at APN, but we're going to go past schedule. We're going to go, you know, another uh, five minutes or so, and then uh, hopefully be able to get to another question or two. So Jeremy. Great. Well, I will uh, shift the discussion to the United States because uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to Dahlia to analyze the Israeli politics. I still want to nitpick the numbers with you a little bit, but uh, you know, there's also the question of the strategy on the ground, and that's NIF's business. But the question for uh, those of us who are American citizens is, what are we going to do in this country? And I actually take uh, these moments of glaring spotlight on uh, you know a future that we are all deeply worried about as a huge opportunity. Uh, you know, this is a rare moment where the center of the American Jewish community suddenly pays attention for a few minutes to what's going on uh, over there. And, and the reality uh, of the creeping annexation, the reality of the growing power of the far right, the reality that uh, a man who, uh, you know, was at Rabin's car in 95, seizing the, uh, you know, emblem off the, off the Cadillac is somehow going to be a minister. It's just shocking to me what large numbers of, of Jewish Americans are completely unaware of all of these things. And so I think there is a huge moment of opportunity for us to grab people's attention to understand what's going on and to make them aware that the organizations and the voices that have been speaking for them for a very long time do not represent them. And that is a huge opportunity. When you see APAC and you see other groups unable to utter a word uh, about Itamar ben Gvir. Uh, and, and about the return of uh, Kahanism into the you know, center of Israeli politics, uh, those organizations and voices are out of tune with the overwhelming majority of Jewish America. And this is a moment for us to seize an opportunity to grow our own power in this country to make sure that our policies and our politics and our Jewish community actually reflect the majority of Jewish Americans who are not in line with the politics and the political shifts that Dali has been outlining uh, in Israel. And we are horrified not just by that, but by what that means for our own country and the exact same types of voices and threats, the overwhelming majority of Jewish Americans are out on the streets this weekend, knocking doors and canvassing and making sure that we do not have these kinds of voices taking critical Senate seats and critical House seats. And it's really a chance for us, I think, to tie the threats together and help people to understand that 
we have to make our voices heard, not only on America, but also what's happening in Israel. So I see huge opportunity. Please come to the J Street Conference and make that voice heard, make it as loud as possible, share that idea with people that you're working with this weekend, that that's the next point we should gather together at. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. So I'm going to um, bring us together with, uh, I think, a closing thought, and I want to ask one more question, actually. You know, I think, Jeremy, you talked about it, uh, Libby, when you were talking before about, you know, what we're seeing there, you know, it just, it, it brought up for me, seeing Charlottesville here and people in their khakis saying Jews will not replace us. And, you know, there, the, the equivalent of, you know, the Arabs are voting in droves, right? Like we're seeing the same kinds of um, policies and the same kind of politics coming forward, frankly, you know, from the right wing in both countries. Um, and I, I think it's hard for us to say a few days before our elections here exactly what maybe our Congress could be doing, because we'll have to see what that Congress is going to look like. But there's one really specific question that actually Sam Bahor put in the chat. And uh, thank you, Sam, for asking this, because I think it's a good one for us to sort of end on. And it's, you know, I'm just going to read it. It says, as a reply to this dangerous election development, would you all agree, or what do you think, that now is the time to recognize the state of Palestine for any person, institution, and states that are serious about a two-state solution? And I'll just say, you know, at APN, we've been, of course, and I know everybody else is talking about, what do we do now? What's Things are different. How do we respond? Um, and I think, you know, that's an interesting question as a, as a possible response. So... Anybody want to kick off with a thought on that? I would just like to say um, hi to Sam. What an honor that you're here on this call with us. Um, I think that over, this isn't a direct response to your question, um, but I, I do want to say that over the last year and a half, um, I have most certainly noticed um, an increase in the amount of Palestinian voices that are coming into the Israeli media in a variety of ways, um, and also more diversity of views coming in from that. I think that will have, I think it's already having a massive impact on how Americans are understanding the conflict. Um, and I think it will continue to have that. Um, recent polling, and I, I don't like to talk about polls around Jeremy and Dahlia, because you'll, you should take this part away, but um, in, in recent polls, um, we did see a real uptick in um, favorability, like sort of positive um, uh, attitudes towards the Palestinian cause among Americans. Um, not a de decrease, I don't think, in uh, attitudes towards Israelis, but an increase on the Palestinian side. And I would tie that directly to just hearing from more Palestinians. And Sam, you have done so much as just an individual um, in meeting with Jewish groups in meeting with American groups and sharing your story in such an effective way. Um, and I think that's a really big part of what's needed now. Um, and that's all I wanted to say is just a warm thank you for the question and for the attendance. Um, also, one of my favorite short stories ever written is um, a Michael Shabon story called the, the tallest man in Ramallah wants to show me his cage and it's about you Sam so I encourage everybody to to read that in the anthology kingdom of olives and ash um, and I'll stop there all right thank you Libby you know I just uh will note I I, I should have done this beginning because that felt unfair to throw that out there um, you know, that's something uh, acknowledging uh you know recognizing a, a Palestinian state is something APN has, call, has called for um, called for the U.S. government to do, I should say. Obviously, it's nice for us to stand here and say it, but it's not quite the same relevance. And and again, I, I say that not as, you know, I, I don't think they're about to do it, and I think there are cha challenges in it. Um, for us, it's something that we felt as we were trying to push them forward that that was uh, something to put on the table. So I will say that. Uh, Dahlia, Jeremy, I don't know if I, any of you, either of you want to touch that or the broader question? I mean, I assume that we're all in favor of it. And I'm assuming that, you know, the overwhelming majority of the 569 people that are watching this are all in favor of that. Uh, but I think we would also all agree with your assessment, Hadar, that this isn't going to happen under this administration. And that goes back to the broader question of how this administration deals with the government of Israel. Uh, and, uh, you know, not only would we like to see the uh, you know, government of the United States doing positive things like recognizing perhaps a, you know, a state of Palestine or not blocking its accession to the UN as a member state, which 
you know, we already supported 10 years ago, uh, you know, it, it just isn't going to happen because the politics in this country uh, are still locked uh, around an ancient vision, uh, you know, of what this conflict is all about and what Israel's all about. And that, you know, again, I go back to the notion that that's the thing we as Americans need to do. Uh, you know, I saw somebody in the the chat sort of uh, uh, disparaging uh, what the American role is in Israel. Uh, and, you know, no, that's not what we're talking about, right? It's not that we are weighing in on what Israel should do. As Americans, we're weighing in what the United States should do. And the United States government should make clear that this relationship between the U.S. and Israel has is, is always been based on a notion that we share something in common. Uh, and, and if the state of Israel is adopting government policies that are moving it away from where the United States sees its interests and its values, uh, then the United States should take more forceful stands against it. And it should put meaningful teeth behind the idea that its resources shouldn't be going to deepen the occupation on a daily basis, right? There should be some consequence for evictions and demolitions and settlement expansion if we're opposed to those things. And we should allow consequences to happen in international fora uh, if Israel is violating international law, right? We shouldn't stand in the way. We should be allowing that to happen. And these are the kinds of things that are American policy. And as American citizens, and particularly for the Jewish Americans in the group, uh, it's our community's responsibility uh, to step forward and to step you know, out on these issues and make sure our voices are being heard here. It's not about Israel. It's about the United States and its policy. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay, Dahlia, I, we're going to wrap up. I want to uh, just give it to you for some closing thoughts. Yeah, closing thought. Just on the quick question of uh, Sam's question. Hi, Sam. It's nice to have you here. I would say that, uh, sure, I mean, I would happily support America recognizing Palestinian state, but what I think is as urgent, maybe even more, although I would never tell a Palestinian was urgent, but uh, that America should be trying to move the region to a situation where the Palestinians actually have real sovereignty, meaningful sovereignty over their lives. Otherwise, recognition can easily become a fig leaf, and I do worry about that. I think that there's many ways that the America could step in and try to uh, move Israel in the direction of actually allowing Palestinians to govern their lives. So that's one thing. Uh, the last thing is on Ben Kavir. Just because a couple of people mentioned what happened, you know, uh, 27 years ago, let's remind each other, I, not to make it worse, but he's no better now. You know, on election night, he led his supporters with a speech saying, we will show them that we are the masters of the house. They can't run around acting like they own the place. And then his supporters started chanting death to they said terrorists, what they meant was Arabs. And so this is not just about his history. I would never entirely blame somebody just for their history if it had if they had made amends, but he hasn't. He is unreformed and we have to remember that he is no less dangerous. And I think his supporters, I don't wanna demonize them because that doesn't help, but if they're gonna take that approach that they did on election night, we have to be very vigilant. Yeah. And I don't think, you know, Dahlia, showing shining light on what people are doing and saying is not demonizing right i mean that is the unfortunate reality um well i wish we were not ending on that really cheery note but you know that's sorry that's not this week um no that's quite all right um, uh, i do want to remind everybody we have recorded this uh we're going to share it with throughout the whole or the whole pin network so thank you for those of us who joined i know some of you have been typing in you weren't able to be here for the whole time feel free to share it with others um, again, I want to thank Dahlia and Jeremy and Libby uh, for joining me for this today, but far more for that than really for all the work that you guys are doing and for your friendship and your partnership. So thank you all. And, you know, we'll keep fighting. Thank you, Hadar. Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks very much. Bye.